22 says, And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But, and then last week we talked about the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them have the great light shined. And that light, of course, was the, the birth of Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, so the increase of his government. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with the justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Uh, when you, you can't really get into this passage and just teach on one of these. You, you really got to kind of break it down and walk through it. And as I'm walking through this mighty God thing, I was actually shocked uh, how much scripture I had to pull from this message in order to condense it because the, uh, of the mighty acts of God and the mighty things of God and, and how many times the Scripture talked about Him being mighty. Last week, we began this series of messages concerning the offices of the Messiah by discussing Him as a wonderful counselor. And Isaiah said His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Of course, they didn't know His name would be called Jesus at the time. But when you talk about the wonderful counselor, you're discussing the mind of God as it relates to His plan. But when you talk about the mind of God, you're talking about His hand involved in the plan. When you walk through Isaiah, he had a tremendous insight. I think it was in chapter 40, chapter 41, that says that he gathers the sheep in his hands and holds them close to his heart. Uh, it says that his head, I've often used the thought that his head was, was too wise to make a mistake. His hands were too powerful to let us down. His heart was too powerful for him personally to hurt us. That's the power of God as you're moving through life and you start seeing him as an entity, not as some blob in heaven or, or, or a spirit floating around. But this is the anatomy of God. This is who he is. And so we see him with arms and legs and this, this, this function as, as a, uh, if you would, as a man. Christ is the heroic contestant who entered into warfare with the foe. When Jesus showed up, it was a fight. It was military. There was something about it that we miss. I think we've missed that church is more, should be a little more militant than what we are and what we have been. When you walk through this, he stood alone with the great accuser, the most subtle of all assailants, that dreadful devil who is the divisor of deceit, the destroying devourer, and the dictator of death. We realize that Jesus stood there with him and was tempted three times and yet was without sin. And, and when we talk about the spheres last week, we, we, we walked into two of them, two spheres, two agendas, two activities, and they were committed to two words. And those words, of course, was darkness and light. Uh, when you shift and when you think about it, the, con the contrast here, the details of darkness, uh, darkness calculates its victims. Well, catch this. And it captivates its victims. Then it conquers its victims. Anytime you leave light and you head into darkness or you stay in darkness, darkness has a way of calculating, okay, how long is it going to take me to subdue you? Second, when it's going to look and it's going to try to captivate you. There's a certain draw to, uh, to living in darkness. Once you've been there, we've often said that uh, sin is fun for a season, it, but but the thing is with that, and if sin wasn't fun, how many know none of us would have done it or still be doing it? Don't answer that. Uh, but that's what sin does. It, it, it draws us. And we who have our, our kids and other people that we know, we've seen this, this captivating, this drawing them in. And then it conquers them. It overwhelms them, and it keeps them there. And then that's where destruction comes from. There's a certain demand of darkness. Isaiah 8.22 says, And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Driven means compelled or to be drawn into. It has a sucking uh, force to it that just pulls people into it. Once you start down that road, it's a downward. You know, when I studied Jerusalem to Jericho, the, the Bible says there was a certain man who fell into trouble on his way to Jericho. Well, when you study the geography, uh, Jericho is a steep passage downward from Jerusalem. So it's easy to go down. It's easy to walk down. It's easy to start. That's why serving God at times becomes a hard thing, at least to get up and out, to start moving forward, to get into a certain place with God. So when you're studying this, you realize that Colossians 1.12 says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. 
So God calls us into light. He gives us an inheritance there who has delivered us from the power of darkness. There's the, that's the thing that's trying to hold us. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That word power is a, a, a shadiness and a, a obscurity, the air of darkness. That, that, that power that tries to hold you back. It's something you have to be called out of. I think when you got born again, you may not have realized it, but there was a voice pulling on you. When you're in darkness, if you cannot see a light, listen for a voice. If you're in darkness and you can't see a light, listen for a voice. Here's something calling you up out of there. How many of us have been in a dark place at one time and yelled and called out for help, a father? The Bible uses the term, the father has done this. Dad! Help me, pull me. And to hear that voice and to hear the voice come back to you begins, you start following that voice. So we get called out of darkness. God called all of us out of darkness. He, he called you by name. He pulled you out. Uh, Peter says in chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Well, that you know. That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he incited you by the word. Many times the, the calling we hear is when you hear the word of God preached and it starts to pull on you. You go, oh, I get it now. And it brings you further and further out of darkness. And eventually darkness doesn't have the grip it once had on you. And now you are free. A lot of times on, on Sundays, guys, I realize there are people that come to church and, and they give their lives to Christ. But that's only the beginning. That's only the very beginning of being called out of darkness. You've got to stay with this thing. It's increments. It's line upon line. It's being pulled out, HUD. It's, it's getting closer and closer. And the closer you get, and you, not only are you called out of darkness into light, but you start hanging out with a fellowship of light. And when you hang out with people of light, then it's a whole lot easier just to, to serve God. Can I get an amen? Now, here we find the divine defender. His name shall be called Mighty God. Mighty means to excel, powerful, champion, warrior, to be strong, prevail, to be valiant. Uh, I, I skipped over the word, but in the Hebrew language, the word is El Gibor, the warrior. El Gibor, G-I-B-B-O-R. If you go to Israel, you will often see this word even on some doors as, they, as the men are called Gibors, warriors, and the women are called Gibores. In Israel, the, the Jewish people, it's male and female that fight. They're born fighting. They come up learning to skill a fight. Why? Because they have to protect their, their land, their geography. I watched an interview with uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu the other day, and he is a stout dude. And he don't back off. And they, he, he was talking about Trump and is this good for Israel? And he said, we'll see. And, and they're connecting economically even with China and Russia and other places. They're, they're branching out. They're even selling some of their inventions. They, they have more inventions in Israel than anywhere else in the world. These guys, they are bright. They're smart. But the issue is there's that warrior in all of them that if we don't fight, we could lose everything we've gotten since the 1940s, you know, that we got our nation back again. And some people are against this and that, and they, they don't recognize them as the state of Israel. And, and they like, you know, how are you going to? If you don't recognize us, that's your call, but we ain't going away because we're Gibors. We're warriors, and our women are female warriors, and we serve the El Gabor. The mighty warrior. That's who God was to them, and that's what he looks at. So it's important to look at that and realize Jeremiah had a description of this mighty one. He said everything he does is mighty. Everything God does is a mighty thing. Uh, he said, Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompenses the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children. After them, the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name, great in counsel and mighty in work. Now, I look at the life of Jeremiah and I realize he's the weeping prophet. He never got a convert. He, he's a guy that stays along, and yet he had the ability to look at God. I can look back at my life and tell you God has been mighty. I've seen God do tremendous things. And I, even here for American believers, I've seen God do stuff for our, our lazy, for us. I've seen God do it. And I, I believe he's a mighty God. And Jeremiah, even though he never had a prophet, he looked at God and he said, he's great in counsel. Again, last week we talked about the wonderful counselor. If you could just get to talk to him and listen to him and let him talk with you. Great in counsel, mighty in deeds. So and in deeds and doing is what he's good at. Isaiah had a description of him in chapter 11. He said, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of the roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might. It throws those together. He's not only, you know, in other words, if he gives you counsel, that's one thing. But if he turns around and stands for you, that's another. 
And he's standing up. He's, a, he's that kind. John the Apostle said this, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the, the works of the devil. So that El Gabor of the Old Testament is the baby that was born in Bethlehem. He's the mighty God. And he showed up here for a reason. He showed up to destroy the works of the devil. That was his purpose on earth. And again, defining the works of Jesus was pretty easy. He came to save sinners and whoop the devil. Sometimes we get it messed up, guys. We get too big of a purpose in life. We're trying to make this big, long thesis of why we're here and what we're doing. Can't you simplify it, son, by being a good wife or a good husband, a good dad, uh, you know, a good mom? You simplify it as being a grandpa and a grandma and breaking it down some to live a life of purpose and say, God, I'm here for a reason. Help me to find that reason. It, it's not always great things. What if God told me this is all you're going to get right here, Pastor? As a matter of fact, this group's going to dwindle on you over the years. Well, then I'd have to say, all right, God, I'll take what you gave me. Amen. I'd have to believe that. that I, if that's what he says, is okay. But I, I don't know him as that kind of God. I know him as a God of growth a God of expansion, a God of building, a God of kingdom. So, so in my mind, okay, this, this is a good Genesis, but we can't stop here. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. John, uh, the apostle John, his personal description of him, he said he is alpha and omega. Let me tell you about him. He's the beginning and the end, which is, which was, and which is to come, the almighty. Not just El Mighty or El Warrior or El Gibor, but he's the Almighty. That is who he is. Almighty means the absolute ruling God and dominion and might. That's why when you read the scripture, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and when you're an American, you don't think of kings. You don't think of lords. The only lord we ever hear about is the slum lord or the landlord. That's the only lord we know about over here. We don't even talk about kings. We, we got an idea. We kicked all them back to England, and we ain't got to deal with that. But the issue is he is king of all the kings there ever been. He's Lord of all the lords that have ever been. So when you look at that and you realize how almighty he is, and then he proved it. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I got the keys to hell and death. I took them away. Well, that's a pretty mighty God. Amen. That went down to hell and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The, the might was revealed to men. When Moses got with God, it was the throwing down of the staff that became the snake. It was the, it was the ten plagues of peer pressure. It was the bush that burned. But then God began to really show himself to, to Moses. The Bible says the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Who would dare try to fight God? I remember how, how uh, enamored I was with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, I love that show. My favorite part of the show is when they busted open the ark. And it was like, oh, this is glory. You remember the Germans? Oh, this is glory. The eyes are like that. And then all of a sudden, God went to kicking butt. And he went running through there. And I'm at the theater watching this, you know. And this is before we got into all the CGI's and, and all, the, the, all the crazy things that you've seen on TV. This was kind of new stuff for me. And I remember watching, and I thought, that's got to be how it probably was right there. You didn't mess with the presence of God. He, God, God is a man of war. He, man, he, he's going to go after you. you. You don't defy him. You don't touch the ark when it's been tossed off the cart. You leave it alone. Amen. He is that kind of God. Deuteronomy 26, 8, Moses said, and the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with a great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Of course, the parting of the Red Sea, we see him bringing him out. That's the power of God. That, that's the might of God. That's the mighty God who was to come. Joshua said, and you know, Joshua is the one who took up the mantle of Moses. Moses is dead. And it, it just is fascinating, fascinating me. That God in Moses goes for a walk. It's, it's almost like, okay, Moses is 120 years old now. It got right to the edge of the promised land. And God says, okay, i got to find a successor here. Joshua's done good for 40 years. He, and here's how you find successors. There are people who love you and not your ministry. That's the successors. You find somebody that just loves your ministry, well, they'll try to take it from you. But you find somebody that loves you, they're for you and whatever you're for. So Joshua was for whatever Moses was for. He loved Moses, and he looked after Moses, and he was his armor bearer. But then there came that day when God decided, okay, Moses, I think, I think your expiration date's about up. And, he put, and, and in my mind, I see God putting his arm around Moses, and they taking a walk away from everybody. And Moses is looking back just for a little bit to see the promised land over his shoulder. And God said, don't worry, I'll get you there later. And then he takes Moses off, and then God comes back, and he says, and Joshua said, where's Moses? And God said, he's dead. 
Now, I can't prove it, but I think God killed him. <laughs> I don't know what he did. I don't know if he grabbed him and threw his old body toward heaven. I don't know what God did. You know, God, God's, God's pretty rough in the Old Testament, wasn't he? And, 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 then, and then Joshua gets up, and he gets ready to fight, and he's getting, he, he's, he's got, they've parted over the waters, and, you know, and fixing to go, and he don't know exactly how this thing's going to happen. And, and it says in Joshua chapter 5, and when, Mo, and when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. This, again, is what is known as a theophany. It's God in flesh or showing up in human form. So he says here, Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or are you our enemy? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in, the, in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. Now, when's the last time you heard that phrase? It came out of a bush. And, jo- and Moses, I bet, sat around the campfire all the time. And I, you know, I, I ran with some, cel- with some elderly people. And uh, one of the things I love about elderly folk, they got wonderful stories. And I'll be sitting around campfires with some of the folk who have been in our church, and they'll tell a story. Well, I'll get back around campfire with them again, and they'll tell the same story. And I get back around campfire, and they tell the same story. And, and I actually was with a man uh, uh, the other night, and when I was with him, I walked into a, a party, and he told me a story. And 15 minutes later, he told me the same story. And I actually looked at him because he's about my age. And I said, do you realize you just told me that story? Oh, okay, I didn't know. And then, and then well, it, now, I don't often say that to, the, to those that are older than me. I let them tell that story. Can you imagine Moses probably told that story every time they got around the campfire? That when that fire was blazing up, he looked over at Joshua and said, Joshua, you know what got this whole party started? I was walking around working for my father-in-law at 80 years of age, and I looked over and I saw a fire burning. And that fire told me to kick my shoes off for where I am is holy ground. And I did that, and God gave me the command, and here we are 40 years later on the edge of the promised land. Now Joshua's fixing to go into the promised land, and the water's got a part, and he's got to head toward Jericho, and he really needs some miracles to take place his own self. And then all of a sudden, but now, and, and when you read it, it's kind of like he flips back and forth. Is this the angel of the Lord, or is this the Lord? Is this the angel of the Lord, or is this the Lord? I don't think it really mattered much to, jo- to Joshua, but let me tell you this. You don't worship angels. And the Bible says he bowed down in reverence. So I think this was God himself that showed up. And then, and then to prove it, he speaks and says... Take off your shoes. The place you're at is holy ground. I bet Joshua couldn't wait to unlace them sandals, man, and get them off because now he's with him. Even he knows the Lord commander, El Gabor, was going to go before him. The mighty one was going. So for Joshua, man, it was an exciting time in his life. It's a good thing to think to yourself, you know, really, I ain't got to fight this fight. God will fight it for me. And then when they got over there, they never had to lift a sword. All they had to do was march around the city. Strange stuff God can do. Amen, to win things and make things right in one's life. David said in Psalm 24, lift up your heads. And I love this scripture. Oh, you gates and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? When I think about lifting up the gates, I think about lifting up our hands. Amen, pulling up the gates. So that, that, you got to, I love the old uh, gladiator and the brave hearts and the shows like that. When, when, when they, when, you know, I even watch a show now called Vikings, you know, and you'll, you'll see the, the, the gates of the city and stuff and, and somebody to be riding toward it and yell, yell, open the gates, open the gates. And, and they swing them big doors open. And who's riding in on a white horse? It's the king of glory. Lift up your gates, man. Lift up your heads, O oh, ye gates. It says, uh, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who? The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O oh, ye gates. Lift up your everlasting doors for the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. I love that kind of symbolism and that kind of talk, it, it kind of gets you excited about it. And it's a, it's a part of our praise. It's why we praise to open up the doors, lift up the gates, and let the king come in. Amen? That's a powerful thing. He's mighty in the midst of us. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. You've not heard the word Zephaniah in years. You didn't even know that was in your Bible. 
a little three chapters of Zephaniah, just a little minor prophet, just a little fellow. But he said some powerful things. He says, sing, O daughter of Zion. That's the church. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away your judgments. He's cast out your enemy, the king of Israel. Even the Lord is in the midst of thee. Hmm. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In the day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion the church, let not your hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of you is mighty. If you can get God in there, why don't we worship him? Not only to, to tell him how wonderful he is, but that there's worship invites his presence. And when you get him in the midst of you, what is he? Mighty. That's why I believe that healing takes place during worship. That's why I believe that deliverance takes place during worship. That's why I believe that when we worship God and we come together, great things take place during worship. You don't always have to have the prayer line or the preacher or the email or the text. You know, if you could just worship God and watch him come in in the midst of you because that's where he is mighty. Many of us, we're waiting on something else to do something, but, but why don't we try it? Why don't we worship him to the place? The Lord thy God is mighty. He, he'll what? He'll save. I can be. Sa I need that saving. He'll rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in. His, you'll rest in His love, and He will joy over you with singing. I will. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of them, and to them to whom the reproach as it was uh, as it was a burden. The midst is the nearest part, the center, the one in charge. When God gets in the middle of us, He is mighty. Amen. Verse 15 says it this way. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of you. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. Listen, he's taken away our judgments. He's cast out the enemy. He's established our future. He won't see evil anymore. The, those things that, you know, evil has to do when your plans fall apart. When things you thought were going to happen didn't happen. They just fell apart. When that happens, God says, let me get in the midst of you. Now, that's up to you. If you like the way your plans are, then don't worship him and don't bring him in the middle. But if you keep God in the middle of your life, I believe that he's mighty there. Zephaniah 3, 17, there are three things he will. The Bible says he will perform in his presence. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He'll take great delight in you. He'll quiet you with his love. We'll talk about that. And he will rejoice over you with singing. There's something about uh, being a victor, being, getting to be the big guy. Let me just say it that way. Well, you know, when, when you're defending the weak and you win the battle, there's something about looking over and singing over them and rejoicing with them. And, you know, I, I see David when he took down Goliath. It was, it, the scripture says it's not by might nor by power, by my spirit. There's something about God in the middle of us. I'll tell you another little story that's not on the overhead. But the Bible says that when Jesus came back, he met the disciples in the room. And it says Jesus was in the midst. That was the term it used. He was in the midst. When he got in the midst, there was something that was powerful. It was peace in the hearts of the disciples. When he came back in the midst, it wasn't just his presence there. It was the fact that it took an act to get there. And that act was this. Raised from the dead, going to hell, taking the keys of death and hell, and then coming back and getting in the midst of them. He showed himself powerful. The scripture says he'll delight in you. There's nothing like having and knowing that God delights in you. He loves you. You know, and I, I go back to something y'all are tired of hearing about. When my grandkids delight in me, when these children in this church delight in me, I don't know what they've done and what little stinkers have been doing. I ain't got no idea if they've been graffitiing on the wall, not flushing their commodes. I don't know what they've been doing. But when they love me and accept me for who I am, I delight in them. That's something. Oh, you just, you're just excited to be around them. It just, it, you delight in him. The second thing is that he says he'll quiet you. That means he'll give you peace. This commotion that rails up in us, this, 
uh, particularly during this season, this angst is a good word. I think angst must be country short for anxiety. Y'all may have to Google that, and I don't know, but it seems like folk get the angst right now. They got too much anxiety. They're too stressed out, like Dennis was talking about at his job. You know, it just, it's, it's just a little too much. That, God comes in and he quiets you. He calms you down. And, and I think the words would, would be, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. He'll quiet you with his love. Mm. Then it says, he'll rejoice over you. To rejoice means to do again and again and again. When I read this scripture, the Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. You, you need to take this scripture, Zephaniah 317, and make it personal to yourself. Write it down. Quote it to yourself all the week. The Lord my God is with me. He's mighty to save. He'll take great delight in me. He will quiet me with his love. He will rejoice over me with singing. Have you ever thought about what God sings like? Oh, we watch the voice, don't we? There's some that aren't here tonight because they stayed home to see if a local boy would win the voice. I believe the little girl, we go win it. I think she's that good. That other guy, whatever. <laughs> Where I'm from, W.E. still we. Okay. Okay, I don't understand hyphens. That's French. To hear the thing, though, I hear all them voices, beautiful voices, because I, I like that show. I really do. But here's the thing. I wonder what God sounds like when he sings. You ever wonder what God sounds like? Is he a baritone when he sings over you? Has he got a high pitch? No. I wonder what he sounds like. Does he sound country? I hate to thank God raps. <laughs> he will rejoice over you. He will sing over you. What parent worth the salt didn't walk into a cradle and look down at a child and sing over them and sing a song? You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. The skies are gray. You'll never know, babe, how much I love you. Don't take my sunshine away. What, what, what of us have not looked over that cradle, and put our hand on that child, prayed over that baby, sing over that child? See, that, that to me is, is him. Because we're helpless. In your greatest strength, you're helpless. And the older you get, sometimes the more helpless you feel. You've lost the, the, vi the vigor of your youth. And even the young ones, he sings over them. He'll sing over you. So I'll close with this verse out of 1 John 4, 4. It says, you are of children, little God, little, little people, little children. You are of God, little children. You're from God. And you've overcome them. And then he gives us the why. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That little child, wonderful counselor, mighty God, dwells in you. He dwells inside of us. Amen. Because greater is he, the elk boy. Sometimes they got to be a fight rise up in you. They got to be a warrior rise up in you. I hate to think, and I really, this hits me, uh, American believers are a little bit on the sissy side of Christianity. They don't fight in them. There's no perseverance. There's no endurance. There's no guts. There's no getting up. There's no go. You know, there's just too much that knocks us down. But if you realize that, that greater is he that's in you than anything that's out there, that God does these three things over us. He delights over you. He'll give you peace. And he rejoices. He sings over you. It begin to change your life. Father, take your word right now. Put it in the, the fire of the Holy Spirit. And brand it on our hearts. Let us be reminded that mighty in the midst are you. That you do rejoice over us. You do quiet us. You, you calm us down at the right time. That you delight in us. 
the things that he, I know there are things we do that are hurtful and wrong. And, and God, please, take away those judgments, as you said in Zephaniah. Remove the remorse. Remove the regret. Remove the shame from our lives. And rejoice over us. God, we mere children. We, we are those babies in the cradle. And God, just knowing you will sing over us, we delight in that. I thank you for your people. Give us backbone to stand. We serve a mighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. amen. You can stand, go and leave anytime you want.